It's eight in the evening, sometime after the close of our last episode, as private operative Paul Drake walks to the door of Della Street's apartment. Hi, Paul. Beautiful. Della, you look gorgeous. Naturally. It was I surprised when you asked me over here to your place. Uh, uh, I... <clears throat> Hello, Paul. Uh, not so surprised anymore. Uh, business meeting, mm-hmm. huh? Give me a coat, Paul. Yes, thanks. Can I fix you something? Yes, whatever you're having. Hot tea. Okay, straight tea. <laughs> How's your head, Paul? Okay. Well, what's up? Well, everything is ready from our end. But just one more detail. At 10.15 in the morning, Mrs. Barclay's car is going over the cliff by the river. The driver, dressed exactly as Mrs. Barclay will be dressed, will go over the cliff with the car. You mean it'll look like he goes over the cliff? No, no. He will go over the cliff. Hmm? We've got a very good man to pose as Mrs. Barclay. He's a professional stunt driver. Oh. Uh The timetable is as follows. Mrs. Barclay leaves her house at 9 in the morning, telling the servants that she's going for a drive. By 10 o'clock, she's on the little road leading to the cliff over the river. Now, that road goes through a patch of woods. The stunt driver will be waiting there in the woods. He will take Mrs. Barclay's car, drive it over the cliff. Now, here is where you come in. Wait a minute. Do you think I'm going to ride with him? No, 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 Paul, no. I want a man watching him. How do you mean? This driver is taking a big chance, Paul. He may get knocked unconscious. He may get hurt. So have a man there, someone fishing or bird watching, I don't care. But have a good man on the bank of that river. If it goes off, as we planned, your man is to report the accident and call the ambulance. Mm -hmm. Made arrangements with the ambulance? Yes, with the ambulance, the local police, and the local press. Everything is lined up. I'll have Maury Cohen there. Good. How is Mrs. Barkley feeling about this, Perry? Well, how can she feel, Paul? She's willing and eager to do whatever she can. Mm Mm-hmm. Now... This is a map of the area. Yeah. Now, here is the unpaved road by the river. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, this here, that's the spot where he'll go over the cliff. Right. You have Maury waiting there, just in case. Well, as you know, the Gus Perry Mason must find is August Jansen. And as you also know, Gus Jansen doesn't dream he's in the slightest danger. Now, as he walks to his apartment. Gus. Tony. Well, if it isn't Miss Fasina who's in charge of entertainment. What are you doing here? I want to see you. I'm not amused, Tony. Cut it out, Gus. i got to see you. Oh? Important, Tony? Yeah. Now, let me see. Uh, in reference to Gordy? Yeah. I thought so. Get lost, Tony. Gus, I'm listen. not interested in your troubles, Tony. Get lost. I haven't got troubles. No? Not that I know of. As far as I know, everything's fine. You think you know everything, big boy, huh? I'm not a fool, Tony. Won't you come in? Thanks. Hmm. Hmm. You got a nice place. Thanks. You uh, mentioned trouble. Oh, and a portable bar. I didn't think you'd have a bar. You didn't? I need a drink, Gus. Let's talk. Gus, I... I need a drink. Here, I'll... No, I can do it faster. Here. Thanks. It was... It was either have a drink or start crying. If I started crying... Tony. I've got so... You mentioned trouble. Are you going to tell me in fast and without crying? All right, Gus, Tony. Tony, don't... Tell me, Tony. It's Gordy. All right. It's worse than I ever thought. What's worse? The way Gordy feels about Kate Beekman. Oh? Since you've been seeing her, it's 
eating him up inside. He don't think of anything but her. You and her, it, it's all he thinks about. It's too bad. Yeah. But it's nothing to me, Tony. I did all I could. I fixed it so Gordy don't see her anymore. What do you mean he doesn't see her? He sees her inside his head. She's all he sees. Tony, I don't care. That's your problem. I suppose you get out of here. You and Gordy, huh? Both of you tell me to get out. Does the name Sam mean something to you? Maybe. Why? Your new driver. His name's Sam. He's somebody Gordy used to know. Does he mean something to you? He's my driver. Of course he means something. Say the rest of it, Tony. And say it now. Gordy didn't give up. He knows Sam from a way back. And? He paid Sam for something. What? Information. What? I don't know. I only heard one side of the conversation. But I know this. One minute Gordy was a little guy beat down to his knees. One minute he was ready to give up and come back to me. Then he got a telephone call. From Sam? Yeah. You don't know what Sam told him? No. But whatever it was, it changed everything for Gordy. All of a sudden, you have the world by the tail again. All of a sudden, he thinks he's got a way to beat you and get Kate Beatman for himself. I love that guy. You hear me, Gus? I love him. But if I can't have him, nobody else will. If I can't, shut nobody... Up. Don't you talk to me like that. I said shut up. Where's Gordy? I left him at his place. What's his number? Helmut 48100. Don't tell him I'm here, Gus. Don't tell him Don't be you... a fool. Yeah? Gordy? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, gosh. Uh, How's the boy, Gordy? Never better, pal, you. I'm swell. Glad to hear it. What's on your mind, pal? I, uh, I'd like to see you before you go out to the club. Tonight, Gus? Uh, yes, uh, right away, if that's convenient. Well, uh, I'd like to, but uh, some things have come up, pal. You know how it is. Uh, you wanted me to come to your place, of course. Why, um, either way, Gordy, you can come here or uh, I'll meet you halfway. Well, that's mighty nice of you, Gus. I should have told you, Gordy, I got a message from the boss. Oh, yeah? What's J.T. say? I can't tell you over the phone, but the message concerns you. Oh? Of course, if you're too busy, I'll send J.T. a cable. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, look, Gus, there's a cocktail lounge downstairs in my place, you know? I know. Why don't you meet me there and say, uh, oh, an hour, huh? Oh, oh, now I forgot. You don't like cocktail lounges. Not very much, Gordy. Well, I do like them, Gus. <laughs> I'll see you in an hour, pal. Okay, pal. I'll see you. Yeah, oh, wait a minute, uh, Gus. Look, can't you give me an idea what it's all about? When I see you, Gordy. But, Gordy, it's uh, nothing to worry about. Well, I'm awful glad to hear you say that, Gus. You wouldn't kid me. Why should I kid you, pal? Wouldn't you tell me if I were in trouble? Sure you would. I'll see you, Gordy. I'll see you, Gordy. Gus, you won't hurt him. Me? Hurt Gordy? We're pals, baby. Real pals. I'm going to tell you something. Gordy's a boy who asks for trouble. I never saw it fail to happen. Start asking for it and you'll get it. I never saw it fail. <laughs> no, don't worry. Tony, you wise me up in time to keep him out of trouble. That's just what I'll keep him out of. Trouble. See? August Jensen is about to make a startling discovery. The events of the immediate future will profoundly affect a number of lives, including Perry Mason's. By all means, join us on Monday, won't you? It's early evening, shortly after the close of our last episode, as Gus Jansen hurries to his meeting with Gordy Weber. We'll join Gus in a few moments. First, in Bella Street's apartment. Here's your tea, Perry. Mm -hmm. And your ham sandwich. Mm -hmm. No, no, don't move. I'll sit by you. 
Now then, isn't this nicer than a crowded restaurant? Sure you have enough room here on the couch? Hmm. I don't mind being crowded. Hmm. I wish I knew what's troubling you, Perry. Mm-hmm. You haven't been the same since Halverson showed us where you're going to stage the accident. Well, it's something to think about. I know. Perry, give me your sandwich. Mm? Now, I'll give it to me. Now, look at me. No, not through me. I'm not a pane of glass. I'm a real flesh and blood girl. And you're a very pretty girl, too. Thank you so much. Now, before you forget that starting fact for another year, tell me what's wrong, Chief. The setup. But I think it'll work. If Suzanne Barkley really believes her mother's killed in an accident... Oh, no, that part is okay. The location for the supposed accident is wrong. Why, it's a logical place to have an accident. Yes, and if all goes well, it's a good spot. But it's very close to the highway. Yes. It's too close to the highway. We'll have to do it at night, Bella. Sorry, we have to wait until tomorrow night. Do we? Harry, now? Yes, why not? Well, no reason, if you, if you can get ready. It's gone over it. Jake is going to handle publicity. He's standing by. Mrs. Barkley is ready whenever we need her. The stunt driver well, is well, ready. Wait a minute. How about Paul Drake and Halverson and... I'll check with them right now. I'll take his place in the kitchen. No, no, wait. But if you're going to do it now... No, you're... there's plenty of time, Bella, so just sit down. I'll, uh... Oh, Paul. Harry Mason. Did you line up Maury Cohen for that deal tomorrow morning? That's fine. We're going to do it tonight. Tonight. Yes, that's right. There's been a change. Well, sometime around 10 o'clock, so Jake can get the story in tomorrow morning's paper. Now, listen, you and Maury stand by. I'll let you know the exact time in a few minutes. Oh, aren't you going to eat each sandwich? Hmm? Oh, yes, I'll eat two sandwiches. It's not mine, you won't. All right, then make me another one. You have enough ham left? Oh, come on. Just a minute, just a minute. Uh, let me speak to Lieutenant Halverson. Oh, yes, I'll wait. <laughs> you feel better, don't you? I like to make things happen when I can, and this time I can. All we need now is a break, and we'll smash this syndicate. But... Oh, uh, yes, Don, hello. I said we'll smash this syndicate if we get busy. So now, let's get busy. Get hold of your stunt driver, Pat Murphy, and arrange for him to... Meanwhile, only a few blocks away... A member of the crime syndicate Perry Mason's Investigating sits in a cocktail lounge. His name is Gordon Weber. And as you know, he thinks he has damaging information on Gus Jansen. August Jansen is Gordy's bitter rival within the syndicate. So anything which hurts Gus makes Gordy feel good. Gordy's feeling very good indeed as he leans back in his chair. want to buy something, sir? <laughs> Excuse me for laughing, but I, uh, I happened to think of something when I noticed your uh, costume. You did, huh? Yeah, you'll never guess what I was thinking. Just give me three guesses. <laughs> no, I was thinking it's a good thing they got the joint heated. You'd catch pneumonia in that costume. <laughs> and then I thought, uh, maybe they don't have the heat turned on. Maybe that costume makes it seem like they have. <laughs> well, all kidding aside, girl, that's a real cute little costume. Thanks. Now, I'm interested in stuff like that. Uh, professional interest. Why don't you grow up, little man? Huh? I said act your age. Well, now, you really put me in my place, didn't you? Act my age, she says. You think I'm old enough to smoke? Uh, maybe I ought to tell you. Cigarettes cost 75 cents a package. I got 75 cents, but I smoke cigars. You got halos? Yes, sir. They cost a dollar a piece. How many you got? How many? Mm-hmm. Well, half a box, that's $25. Okay, I want them. All of them? Yeah, all of them. That's 25 bucks, right? Okay, here's a $50 bill. Uh, I'll have to get change. You'll have to get nothing. Keep the change. Keep the change, keep the cigars, all but one. I'll take one for good luck, okay? Well, yes, sir. If, you if bet you it's okay. I'm paying you 50 bucks for one cigar. The next time I ask you something, don't crack wise. Yes, sir. Now, like I was saying, I got a professional interest in your costume. I got a nightclub out in the coastal highway. I call the place Tony's. 
The new place? Uh-huh. I've heard of it. Are, are you Tony? No, I'm Gordy. It pleases me to call a place Tony, so I call it Tony's. You understand that? Why, sure, Gordy. And if it pleases me to give a girl a break and let her work on a joint with real class, I go ahead and give her a job. You understand that? Sure I do, honey. Okay, we'll talk about it later. Now, beat it, because here comes the guy I want to talk to. Hello, Gus. Oh, hello, Gordy. Oh, uh, am I interrupting something? Uh-uh, uh-uh. No, she's just leaving. Oh, hey, wait a minute. What's your name? Uh, Salma. Okay, Tom, I'll see you later. Cigars? Cigarettes? Friend of yours? Brand new. Good looking? Uh-huh. Hey, you want to see me? Oh, yes, Gordy. I'll make it snappy. I'm doing out at the club. Hey, Gus, son, bring me a double martini. You have a drink, Gus? No, thanks, Gordy, but uh, you go ahead. I'm going to. Okay, okay, what's on your mind? Well, I'm disturbed, Gordy. I, I'm bothered. Yeah, Gus? Yeah. Because when I spoke to you on the phone a few minutes ago, well, tell me if I'm wrong, Gordy, but uh, I thought you seemed a little irked. A little what, Gus? A little, well, you know, a little impatient with me. Me? You're talking about me, pal? Naturally, I want to know what's the matter. Oh, we've had our little differences in the past. But... Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Of course, nothing important. We've always been pals, eh, Gordy? Oh, well, sure we have. Sure we have, Gus, sure. And if there was anything wrong, I'd tell you. There's nothing wrong, Gus. We've always been friends. We're still friends. Like you say, we've had our little differences in the past. Like when you threw me off and threw off on me being a little guy. Like when you made me look bad in front of J.T. Like the way you sneaked ahead of me with Kate Beekman. Little things like that. But they're nothing, pal. Then, uh, you're not mad? Me? I'm not mad at anybody, pal. Cigar. Least of all you. Cigarette? No, sir, Cigar. Gus. We're, we're pals just like always. Hey, uh, Cigarette? Dama, come here a minute. Cigars? Cigarette? What are you calling her for? Huh? The waiter walked off. We'll sell and send Dama for a waiter. For what? For a drink. For you and me to have a drink together. To prove we're still pals. You want something, honey? Yeah, Thelma. Ask the waiter to get us a couple of martinis. No, not for me, Gordy. Just one, Gus. Just one to prove we're pals. I don't drink anymore. What's the matter with him? Him? Huh. It's a funny thing about him, Thelma. He don't drink. He used to drink. Nick's Gordy. He used to crawl right inside the bottle. Watch your step, Gordy. Oh, it's okay, Gus. It's okay. I'm going to give Thelma a job in a club. I wanted to know the score. Thelma, this fellow offer you a job? Well, he talked about it. I'd advise you not to listen. He's only one of the hired hands. What? Oh, he said he's the boss. I'm the boss. He works for me. Right, pal? I'm going to tell you something, Tom. But now, don't look at him. Look at me and listen to me. You be out at the club next Monday morning. Be out there ready to go to work. Better listen to me, Thelma. I do the hiring and firing. It's that way now, Gus. There's going to be changes. What? Changes. Why? Where do you get that stuff? Never mind, pal. You be there Monday morning, Thelma. Whatever you say, honey. There's going to be some important changes between now and Monday. You're talking about me, pal? I never talk about a friend, Gus. Do I order one or two drinks? I'll tell you what, honey. Just order one for me. But give my friend a package of chewing gum. Chewing gum? <laughs> yeah, yeah. My pal ain't ready for a drink, so he'll take chewing gum. After Monday, he'll be ready for a drink. <laughs> After Monday, he'll be crying for a drink. But in the meantime, he'll stick the gum. But wait till next Monday, kid. You'll see him dive inside the bottle. Now, don't ask me questions, Gus. Just wait, pal. Just wait. Well, Gus failed to learn what Gordy knows. But he's certain Gordy has some damaging information. There'll be important and exciting developments in the near future. So join us tomorrow, won't you? It's ten at night, sometime after the close of our last episode. As you know, Perry Mason made quick but elaborate plans to force Suzanne Barkley to come out of hiding. As you also know, Suzanne must come forward to save her own life and... To identify the mysterious killer, Perry Mason knows only as Gus. Now, Mason's putting his plan into effect. As on a state road some miles outside the city, he 
watching the mileage, Della? Yes, it's just seven-tenths of a mile to the dirt road leading to the river, Chief. Paul? Yeah, I've been looking, Perry. I don't see the lights of Mrs. Parker's car. Oh, well, we just went around the curve. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, there she is. Start slowing down, Perry. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. There's Lieutenant Halverson's car behind Mrs. Barkley. Boy, you couldn't pay me to do what that stunt driver's going to do. Not even $75,000? Turn here, Perry. Yeah, I see it. Uh, what $75,000? Keep watching to see if Mrs. Barkley makes that turn. Yeah, I'll keep watching, but tell me about the 75 Gs. There's a briefcase containing 75,000 Gs, as you say, in Mrs. Barkley's car. She's going to leave it in the car when she gets out. What? Paul. Hey, I'm watching Perry. Yeah, yeah, she turned in behind us. Perry, are you going to pay that guy 75? Just relax, Paul. It's part of the window dressing. Oh, such beautiful dressing. But what gives? Paul, we want Suzanne Barkley to think her mother's been killed in an accident. We want her to read about it in the papers. I know that. I'm smart. So? So we're making it look as if Mrs. Barkley was on her way to pay for information about Suzanne. Oh? And that will have publicity value, see? The papers will carry the story, Suzanne will read it, and we hope come forward, or at least come to the last services for her mother, okay? Yeah. Both cars back there? Yeah. yeah. How far to the cliff, Perry? It's just ahead. Ah, there's the marker. Mm. Well, in the middle of the woods. Uh, Mrs. Barkley's pulling up behind us. Yeah, well, she's going to get in Halverson's car. She'll leave the briefcase on her car seat and the keys in her car. Do you see anything, Perry? No, I don't. Oh, yes, yes. The stunt driver's getting out of Halverson's car. Hey! Huh? It's a woman. No, no, no. He's dressed as a woman. He's dressed just as Mrs. Barkley is dressed. Ah. You kind of had this organized. Kind of. Now, Paul... Oh, wait a second, Perry. He can't drive Mrs. Barkley's car past yours. I know he can't. And he won't, before we make sure. That cliff is just ahead of us. Yeah, I know. Well, do you know that Maury Cohen is down below on the riverbank? Yes, I'm positive. Maury Cohen's the best man I've got. If the driver should be not cold, Maury will pull him out of the river before he goes under. You bring Maury out here yourself? No, but I showed him on the map. Maury is a good man, Perry. He's there, waiting. He's a good man. So is that stunt driver, Pat Murphy. Okay, Paul. I'll pull over so Murphy can drive past. All right, come on, we'll watch. Me too. Watch where you walk. We're almost to the cliff, you know. Careful, Della. Oh! Oh, there. There's a path down the river. There he goes. Perry. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, now watch. Oh! Oh, if only he isn't hurt. Well, let's watch. There's enough moonlight to see. There goes Maury. Mm. Pulling Murphy out. Uh Oh! What's the matter? Is Murphy hurt? No, he's not. Paul! Paul, come back here. I gotta get down there. Paul, don't break your neck on this. There's a light to see by. Hurry, Perry. It's over here. What is? It's here somewhere. I saw it when... There. I told you I saw it. What? The briefcase. The briefcase with the 75 Gs. I saw it fall out when the car turned over. Oh, all the luck. Here, give me. Go oh, wait till I see if it's all here. It's there. The seal isn't broken. Maury! Yeah? Catch this! Perry! Don't throw that kind of door around like that. What's the matter? What happened? Was he hurt, Perry? No, oh, no, but we... Uh... Almost broke Mr. Drake's heart. What? I don't understand. That's all right now, Della. It went off just as we planned. Now, we'll take Mrs. Barkley to your apartment. Shall we get out of here before we're seen? Meanwhile, not far away, in the nightclub headquarters of the crime syndicate... August Jensen goes to the manager's office. Ah, Tony. Oh, hello. Hello, Gus. Where's Gordy? He's in the cashier's cage. Uh, You want me to call him? I'll go get him right now. Now, wait. You talk to him? Yeah, I am. Oh, we've been talking for uh, 30 minutes, so... Uh, you and Kate Beaton have a good dinner? Why, it was a delicious dinner. Yeah, well, that's swell. I mean. What's the matter? You've been drinking, haven't you, Tony? Oh, a couple. Well, you told me to start Gordy drinking. Oh, so but... I did. I also told you to pretend to drink. Yeah, but Gordy's a sharp little guy. 
Yeah, he's a real sharp little guy. He'd get wise if I only pretended to drink. So, so I, I took a couple of little drinks. Okay. Of course. So long as you made him talk. What did Gordy tell you? Nothing. <laughs> oh, well, we, we talked, but you, you were all wrong, Gus. You, you, you mind if I have another little drink? Huh? Go right ahead. You say I'm wrong? Uh, yeah. Um, you were worried about nothing. <laughs> Good, he hasn't got anything on you. That's interesting. Tell me some more. <laughs> well, it's there to tell. Uh, you thought he had something on you. I talked to him and I found out you're wrong. We all make mistakes. Yeah. Well, you, you haven't got a single thing to worry about, Gus. Well, look, look, look at that. The, the bottle's empty. <laughs> Let me have the bottle, Tony. Why? Let me have it. I'm going to show you something. Thank you. I'm going to tell you something first. Then I'm going to show you something. You're lying, Tony. I know what happened. You made Gordy talk. You're smart enough for that. He told you what he's got. It's something big. No. Yeah, Tony. So big you think I'm all washed up and you can lie to me. But... Well, maybe it's true. Maybe I am washed up. That can happen. I've seen things. I've done things. So I tell you, I know you're lying. Now I'm going to show you a trick. It's a barroom trick. Watch what happens when I hit the edge of the desk with this bottle. Look what I got left, Tony. A jagged piece of glass. Now watch this. Yes, don't. I'm not going to hurt you. Not yet. Watch how the glass cuts the upholstery of this chair. You see that, Tony? Think what it would do to a pretty girl's face. Please, don't, Gus. You've got a pretty face, Tony. Gordy found out the cops have been following you. What? He don't know why or what they're after or anything, but they've been following you. When? Last week, he, he, he said last week, he says no matter what the cops are after, you cook because you, your boss will see you cook. Don't say anything else. No, no, don't. Don't lie to me now, Tony. Lie to me now. Why should I lie? I, I sold Gordy out. I double-crossed him because you made me. And if there was any more, I'd tell you because I'm scared of you. <laughs> As you heard, Perry Mason's staged accident went off as planned. But Gus Jansen's discovery could undo all of Mason's plans. What has just happened will have an immediate and crucial effect on the lives of several innocent people. So, by all means, hear tomorrow's important development. It's nine at night, shortly after the close of our last episode, as Perry Mason and Della Street stop in front of Mrs. Barclay's residence. Come here, Della. Perry! Stand close to me while this car passes. What on earth? Well. Hmm. Oh. Oh, I kissed you so they couldn't see our faces. Well, that's a romantic reason. <laughs> Just go right in, Mrs. Barclay's expecting us. Mr. Mason? Hello, Mrs. Barclay. Oh, hello, Miss T. Hello, Mrs. Barclay. Mrs. Barclay, are the servants gone? Yes, there's no one here. Are we going to do it tonight? Yes, we are, immediately. I'm glad. Oh, Mr. Mason, my brother sent a briefcase. Mm -hmm. Where is it? In the library. Uh -huh. Are the curtains drawn? Yes. Here's the briefcase. I, I didn't open it. it it's sealed. Oh, thank you. And don't open it. There is $75,000 in that briefcase. What? Your supposed death in an accident has got to be newsworthy. So that your daughter will read about it. Y yes, but I... Mrs. Barkley, the money and a note will be found in your car after we stage the accident. 
The note will make it appear that you were going to pay for information about Suzanne. Oh, must we do this, Mr. Mason? Yes. When Suzanne reads of my death, she'll think I died trying to find her. Mrs. Barkley, you know why we must make her come forward. Yes, but she'll be heartbroken. But isn't it better to have her hurt for a little while than lost forever? Of course it is. Tell me what to do, Mr. Mason. It's now five past nine. In exactly 12 minutes, get your car out of your garage, drive out La Sona to Central, turn right on Central, and follow Central to the Coastal Highway. All right. You turn south on Coastal Highway for seven miles, and then turn left on State Road 73. You uh, know that intersection? Well, I, I'm not sure that I do. Well, Mr. Mason, if I get lost... Well, we've it... taken care of that. Uh, turn off that lamp, please. I beg your pardon? Oh, never mind here. I'll turn it off. Now, uh, come here to the window with me. This window faces La Sona? Yes. Now, wait till I open the curtain. Now, look down the block. Uh, no, the other side. You see that car? Yes. You notice anything different about the taillights? Well, there are more than usual. Two on each side and one in the middle. That's right. Well, I'll be in that car with Miss Street and private detective Paul Drake. You follow that car. Stay fairly close to us. We'll drive at a normal pace. If we should become separated at a traffic signal, say, you know the general route. Just speed up until you see those lights ahead of you. Yes, Mr. Mason. Now, about a mile off 73, we'll stop in a patch of woods. When we do, cut the lights on your car. Drive up behind us. Leave the briefcase in your car and leave your engine running. And you'll get in our car. That is the point where the stunt driver takes over. Is all that clear? Oh, yes. But what happens after that? Well, after that, you'll be taken to Miss Street's apartment where you'll remain until your uh, funeral. Oh. Now, don't don't worry about this, Mrs. Martin. And even if you should lose our car in traffic, Lieutenant Halverson will be following you. You've gone to a great deal of trouble, Mr. Mason. Well, we want a lot of things, Mrs. Barkley. We want to save your daughter. We want her to identify Gus. We want to smash this syndicate. We can get everything we want if this goes well up to us to make it go well. Well, now you have seven minutes to get to your car and start following us, Mrs. Barkley. Meanwhile, in the nightclub headquarters of the auto theft syndicate, Tony Fasina, on Gus Jansen's orders, goes to the office of the manager. Tony's carrying a bottle of brandy. She walks a bit unsteadily, as if she's already drunk a lot of it. But she hasn't. Tony's starting to put on an act, also on Gus Jansen's orders. And she knows she has to make it good, because Tony's scared of Jansen. Now... What are you doing in here, Tony? Oh, goody... You want a little drink? I ask you a question. You're supposed to be entertaining the people. Huh. Who says so? I do. <laughs> All right, put that down and go to work. I don't have to. Mr. Jansen said I could come in here and have a little drink. What? Mr. Gus Jansen said I could come in here and have a little drink. Now, what have you got to say, little boy? Cat got your tongue, Gordy? Oh, Gordy, don't feel bad. Tony will pour you a little drink. I don't want a drink. Have one, Gordy, please. Uh, Here's a nice little drink for Gordy. A nice little drink for the little man. You want to watch your step, Tony. Yeah? Why? Because if you don't watch your step, I'm going to bounce you out of here. I'll stay here as long as Mr. Jansen wants me to. Uh Uh-huh. And that's the way it is, so why talk about it? Mr. Jansen's the man now. He is, huh? And you and me, we work for Mr. Jansen. So don't talk mean to me, Dorothy. Um, let's be friends, Gordy. Get away from me! Ah. Gordy, won't you be friends with me like, like we used to be, honey? <laughs> I, I, I'm going to sit on your lap. I'm going to dump you on the floor. Hey! You know where Mr. Jansen is now, Gordy, huh? Where is he? Mr. Jansen is having dinner with a certain redhead. Guess what redhead I'm talking about. He's having dinner, huh? Well, I hope he enjoys it. 
Give me another slug of that. Hey, this is my bottle. I said, give me another drink. Mr. Jansen didn't say you could drink. He said I could drink. He's going to be awful mad if you get tight, Gordy. Yeah, you think so, huh? You can't drink very much without getting tight, Gordy. You're such a little guy. All right, watch it, baby. Mm, we used to have a lot of fun, Gordy. We used to have fun before he came back. You mean Gus? Uh-huh. I thought you liked him. Like him? Uh, everything's changed since he came back. No, I don't like him, but... Well, he's the boss now, so... Uh, that's the way it is. That's the way it is now. Yeah, and that's the way it'll stay. I, I just wish... It... Yeah? Oh, I wish you'd taken care of him, Gordy, but... Well, you can't. He's too smart, and he's too big for you to handle. So here, here we are working for him while Mr. Jansen's in there holding hands with the redhead. Oh, I don't feel bad, Gordy. He, he's bigger than you and, and tougher than you, and, and that's just the way it is. So why oh, feel bad? Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> I don't feel bad, Tony. I feel good. Yeah? I never thought you'd take a licking and feel good about it. Who says I took a licking? Who? Oh, look, this is Tony. I see what's going on. Mm -hmm. He gave you a licking and he made you like yeah. it. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you something, Tony. I'm going to tell you who's licked. Gus Jansen. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, you're talking through your hat. You think so, huh? You think so, baby. The cops were following him last week. Cops? That's right. Why? How do I know? A hundred reasons. Gus has done plenty of things. Did you tell the cops? Me? Oh, no, no. I'm too smart for that, but they're on to him for something. Well, that don't mean nothing. It means plenty. Because they're interested, and that's something Gus can't stand. He can't stand it because I'm going to let some people know the cops are interested in it. Well, maybe it's nothing important. You don't get it. No matter what it is, the cops have an interest. So Gus is cooked. You mean it? I told you, I feel good. Is he really cooked, Gordy? Honest? Yeah. And there's no way he can wiggle out? No, he's cooked. He's walking around, but he's a, he's a dead man and he don't know it. Now, how do you feel? Now I feel good. Now I feel real good. Get another glass, Gordy. Get another glass and let's have a real drink. What Tony just learned could put Gus Jansen on the alert if she tells him. But as you know, Tony hates and fears Gus Jansen. So will she tell him? Well, join us tomorrow, won't you? It's early evening, shortly after the close of our last episode, as Gus Jansen, the man responsible for Sue Barkley's disappearance drives to the nightclub headquarters of the Auto Theft Syndicate. More of Gus and of Kate Beekman and Tony in a few moments. First. Harry, there's a parking space in front of the Jacobson's apartment. Oh, yes, but uh, we're not going to park. Della, take the car, go to the corner, phone Mr. Wallace, make certain he can get that briefcase out of the vault in time. Right. Uh, can I use Jake's phone? Oh, no, Jake doesn't expect this tonight. There may be other people in the apartment. Now phone Mr. Wallace, then phone Paul Drake. Yeah. Make certain that he has got the car with the special taillights. Uh, tell Wallace to have the briefcase delivered to Mrs. Barkley. Tell Paul Drake to have the special car parked across the street and half a block down from Mrs. Barkley's house. You got all that? You bet. Okay, now I'll speak to Jake. I'll meet you in five minutes, Bella. Okay. Mason. Oh, you by yourself, Jake? Well, Helen's in the bedroom with Jimmy, but there's nobody else. Oh, good. Oh, no, no, don't call Helen. There isn't time. Hmm? Look, we're going ahead tonight, and minutes count. Suzanne Barkley's life is in danger every minute Gus is free to walk around. Yeah, but we got angles to figure, Mr. Mason. They're figured. He's your editor, all set. Well, that's what I mean. You want the accident covered in out-of-town papers. Yes, it has to be. Which means the wire services will have to pick it up. Well, they will. Mr. Mason, I'm a newspaper man. Yes, Mrs. Barkley's a prominent, wealthy woman. 
Uh, sure, the out-of-town papers will carry the item if she's supposedly killed in an accident. Jake. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. I know about this stuff. They'll carry the item. But on page 10. Suzanne Barkley may never see the story unless it's on page 1. It'll be on page 1. Tell me, is money news? Money? Sometimes. When Mrs. Barkley's automobile was over that cliff tonight, the ambulance drivers are going to find something else besides Mrs. Barkley's uh, body. They're going to find a satchel containing $75,000. 75000 Also in the satchel will be a note. The note will imply Mrs. Barkley was on her way to meet certain persons who promised to give her information in regard to Suzanne in exchange for $75,000. Oh. Will that make page one? When you break the story of Suzanne's mysterious disappearance? It'll make it. It's got a twist, Mr. Mason. Suzanne will think her mother was killed while trying to locate her. Oh, it's rough on the girl, but we have to make her come forward before Gus reaches her, or before he gets suspicious. Now, Paul Drake will have a man on the scene of the uh, supposed accident. Well, what's he supposed to be doing on the scene of the supposed accident? Well, I don't know, bird watching. At night? No, he's crazy about owls. He's an owl watcher. Forget this, Jake. We can't seal up all the loopholes. We have kept secrecy as long as we have, only because we've been lucky. Now we're going to depend on speed and surprise. Okay, Mr. Mason, outline it for me. All right. Now, I have a map here. Yeah. Let me see. Now, it'll happen here. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Barkley will turn off State Road 73 here and take this county road. Mm -hmm. And that runs through a patch of woods. Yeah. In the woods, she'll stop her car and the stunt driver will take over. Meanwhile, August Jansen enters the nightclub, makes his way to Tony Fasina's dressing room. Hello, Gus. Listen, oh, Tony. I... Kate's behind the screen. What? Kate Beekman's changing her dress behind the screen. Who is it, Tony? A uh, friend of yours, honey. Who? Oh, I've been looking for you, Kate. Oh, gosh. Oh, I, I, I've been working in the kitchen and I changed my dress. Were you looking for me, August? Mm-hmm. In which case, I'll leave you two alone. Uh, where are you going, Tony? Well, if you really want to know, I'm going to see if the dance team is ready to use their new number. I'll uh, be seeing you, lovely. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, I was going to ask Kate to have supper with me. Well, I couldn't be happier. <laughs> You're an amusing girl, Tony, but let me explain, will you? I also want to tell you about a new act I'm going to book next week. Oh, Kate, uh... Do you mind checking with the dance team for Tony? While you're doing that, I'll tell Tony about the new act, and you and I'll have supper, okay? Well, if, if it's all right with Tony. Oh, of course it is. Isn't it, Tony? Oh, sure. Oh, and hurry, Kate. I'm hungry as a bear. <laughs> all right. What's the matter? Didn't you talk to Gordy? I talked to him. Now you're going to talk to him. Why? Because Gordy won't talk to me. But he'll talk to you, Tony. Gordy's a little guy who's got to talk. You just said... Not to me. But he'll talk to you. You can twist him around your little finger. Uh, yes, you can, because I'm going to tell you how to do it. Yes, You'll I... do it, Tony. Now, listen to me. Gordy's got something on me. What? I don't know. That's what you're going to find out. No. I didn't hear you, Tony. I thought you said no, but of course you didn't. Gus, please. You didn't I... say no. You didn't say anything. Now, you let me explain. I had Gordy where I wanted him. Until tonight. He was beat down to his knees until tonight. He's not beat anymore. He feels ten feet tall. And only one thing could make the change. He's got something. I told you. I but... thought it was a little something, too. Yes. Till I saw the change in him. I've got to know what he knows. So talk to him. You know how to handle him. Gus... Were you about to say no? Don't say it. Do you want me to hand him a real double cross? No, Tom. I know you, Gus. Once you handle whatever it is, you'll go after Gordy. I wouldn't hurt a hair of his head. Who do you think you're talking to? Who do you think you're talking to? Gus, I'll don't. Listen. Don't. Please. Oh. You'll do it because I tell you you're scared of me. That's the only reason you're scared of me. I'll fix you good. Now look at me. Don't. I'll fix you forever if you don't. Oh, Kate. Well, that didn't take long. There's going to use the new routines, Tony. Well, Tony, didn't you hear, Kate? Don't you feel well, Tony? Yeah, yeah, I, I feel okay. I, I've got a headache. 
Oh, come have coffee with Kate and me. No, thanks. As you wish. Um, ready, Kate? Mm-hmm. Uh, do you need me anymore, Tony? I'm sure she doesn't. Oh, Tony, uh, we what? haven't decided about the new act. Do you agree with me? Well, uh, I-, I don't know. No? I thought it was plain and clear. It's, uh... oh, it's a very interesting act, Kate. It, uh, it's got an interesting history. Oh? Yes, I happened to see it first in France. It was three years ago. I was telling Tony, it's got an interesting and a tragic history. A team of adagio dancers. Be sure to study their technique, Kate. They're very good. All right. But y- you said a, a tragic history. Oh, yes, yes. This isn't the original team. The woman is new. The woman in the original act was a talented girl, but uh, she was foolish. I won't bore you by repeating this, will I, Tony? No. Well, as I was saying, she was a foolish girl. She was in a position to help a friend of hers. A friend asked her to do him the favor, but uh, she refused. What happened? Well, I say the girl was foolish because she became friendly with this man. He was an evil fellow. When she refused to do him the favor, he became angry. There are evil men in this world, Kate. Men without conscience. Men who kill without remorse, even with pleasure. Did did he kill her? Why, no. As a matter of fact, no one could prove he did anything at all to her. But someone did. One dark night as she was leaving the theater, someone, no one can say for certain who, someone threw acid in her face. Oh! Poor girl was horribly disfigured. Naturally, she doesn't dance anymore. In fact, she doesn't let anyone see her. Well, that's enough talk of tragedy. Let's talk of gay and happy things, shall we, Kate? What about a steak, my dear? Oh, uh, any questions, Tony? No. Then you'll go ahead with the new act? Yes, Gus. Good. (laughs) Well, we'll see you later, Tony. Tony understands August Jansen's veiled threat. She knows Gus is threatening her if she doesn't twist Gordy around her finger. We'll learn what happens tomorrow, so by all means, join us, won't you? It's 10.30 at night, shortly after the close of our last episode. As Gus Jansen leaves the nightclub, drives with furious, reckless speed toward the city. More of Gus Jansen in a few moments. First, in the office of newspaper columnist Jake Jacobson. Yeah? You know who this is, Jake? Yeah. It just happened. Was it okay? Perfect, so far. Now you've got to keep the ball rolling. Your editor in the building? Right. In his office? Yeah. It's only an hour before deadline. Well, the witness won't phone you for half an hour. You'll have to make your editor reserve some space on page one. Yeah, I know. Can you do it? Or break a leg trying. Okay, break a leg. Uh-huh. Speak to you later? Maybe. We'll see. Yeah. Oh, it's you, Jake. One page made up? Ready to put it to bed, unless something breaks. It will. Mason just phoned me. He staged the phony accident a little while ago. Oh, yeah? So as of now and until further notice, Mrs. Barkley's dead, huh? Uh Uh-huh. Or she will be when the witness phones me. Save me a three-column spread on page one, huh, Arch? Sure, and I got the story in. Hey, wait a minute. When the witness phones you? Yeah. Mr. Mason planted a witness at the scene of the accident. He'll phone me any minute. Well, naturally, I can't write the story until I've been tipped off. Well, Mr. Mason, just tipped you off. Arch, take it slow. This has got to look right. Mr. Mason has nothing to do with it. Oh, he faked the accident. I mean officially. Officially, I have to wait for the witness. I want to use his name in the story and get first-hand details. It's got to, got to look right. What about my front page, Jake? Don't it got to look right? 
What happens if I save your space and the guy don't phone you the story? Arch, he will. How do you know? Because Mr. Mason's got it set. Uh Uh-huh, Jake. No story, no space. Arch, I gotta have front page space. What's the matter with you? You getting old? You scared to take a chance? A little chance? No. But what if I'm caught short and have to fill up my front page with garden club news? Taking an awful chance on this kid. Don't needle me about getting old. Making a page one story is no daisy chain. I know, Arch. But we're justified. If Mason's right about the syndicate. And if the news of her mother's death makes Susan Barkley come forward. Yeah. If it works, nobody will get mad. But if it don't... Who's the witness? The accident was staged out by the river. Mason's got a private detective planted there to see it, call the ambulance, then call me. Ah, private detective... How's he going to cover himself? What's he supposed to be doing this time of night out in the river? Arch, I don't know. He'll tell me when he phones in. What's he going to tell you? I don't know, Arch, but quit worrying. You've seen Mr. Mason operate. Okay, Jake. You got your space. Thanks. Hey, Jake. Hmm? uh, You think it's going to work? You think the girl will come in when she reads her mother was killed in an accident? I know she better... The guy called Gus, uh-huh. he's after the girl. And he's ahead of the cops. I wonder who he is. Yeah, so does Mason, and he means to find out. I'm betting on Mason. Yeah, me too, boy. So is Suzanne Barkley, if she only knew it. See you, Arch. And thanks for the space. Uh-huh. As you know, Gus is actually August Jensen. And at this moment, Gus stops at a dingy side street bar and restaurant. Hello, honey. Want me to sit down? What do we have to drink? You look thirsty, big boy. How do you know you haven't looked at me yet? What? What'd you say? You aren't looking at me now. I'm looking at you. Hello, Jean. Gus. Gus Jensen. Gus! How are you, Jean? I... Gee, it's been so long. I... You didn't recognize me? Oh, yeah. Oh, Gus, you look wonderful. You look... You look at me. I'm going to break down and bawl and... My mascara will run. Then how will I look? How do you think I look, Gus? Same as always, Jean. I'll go on. I've changed. Haven't I changed? You're even prettier. Could always make a girl feel good. No, I've, I've changed all these years. Oh, not so many, Jean. It's been a long time. Yeah, you, you haven't even noticed my hair. Huh? Yeah, I, I changed the color of my hair. You like it? Mm-hmm. Nick, uh, Nick owns this place. Nick likes us to have blonde hair. I want to ask you something, Jean. Information. Oh, uh, might have known. You better order a drink. I don't drink. You don't? Really? You have changed. Just the same, you'd better order one and one for me, too. Okay, we'll make Nick happy. Two champagne cocktails, waiter. I'll well, keep the boss off your neck long enough to ask you something. Hey, listen, you don't have to buy me a drink. What kind of a place you think this is? I can sit at anybody's table I want. Okay, okay. So don't get the wrong idea. Now, what is it, Gus? I own a place outside of town. Yeah? See, I'd, I'd like to see it. You got trouble? Hmm. I don't know. Possibly you can tell me. You know a lot of people. You hear a lot of talk. Just learned the cops are checking. I have no idea why. But as I say, uh, you know people. You hear talk. I haven't heard a thing about you. I used to be an important guy in certain quarters. If the cops are checking me, there's been talk. No, I'm not holding up, Gus. Honest. I haven't heard... You think of something? Maybe. It's, It's funny. I... 
I've been going with a fella. Nothing serious. Just going around for laughs, you know. Well, here's what's funny. His name is Gus, too. Hmm? Huh? Yeah, this fella I'm going with now, the, the cops checked him last week, too. What? He runs a small book. It's real small, and he thought the cops were on them for that, but it wasn't. See, he did time once. For what? For what? What did he take a fall for? Oh, he, he stole a couple of cars when he was a kid. But that was years ago. Anyhow, when the cops checked him, he asked around because he thought it was because he makes books. Yeah, yeah, and? Well, that wasn't it. They checked him because his first name's Gus. Because he stole a car. The way he got it, the cops are checking fellas named Gus who were mixed up with a stolen car wreck. But that's got nothing to do with you. You aren't mixed up with a hot car racket. You got a nightclub. And that's that's why I didn't put two and two together. Now, oh, honey. Now, I don't know why they're checking you. You don't have anything to worry about. The police haven't anything on you now, do they, honey? So why worry? God, look. Nick goes home early on Friday night. He'll, he'll leave in a little while. It's just as soon as he leaves out. I'll tell the bartender I'm sick, huh? Then I'll meet you outside and we can go somewhere and, and talk over old times. Or don't you want to? I guess you don't. Well, I, I don't blame you. I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't help you. You help me. I'll see you, baby. God, don't leave. Sorry, I got things to do. I'll see you, Jean. Oh, uh, here's the dough for the drinks. I always pay for what I get. See you around, baby. Gus Jansen doesn't intend paying for what he'd just learned. Others will. Others, such as Sue Barkley and Kate Beekman. Unless. Well,. You'll join us Monday, won't you? It's almost midnight, shortly after the close of our last episode. And already the carefully planted story of Mrs. Barclay's fatal accident is being circulated. As you know, Suzanne Barclay's mother was not in an accident. Perry Mason staged the entire affair to force Suzanne out of hiding. And as you also know, Mason's bold action is justified. For not only does breaking the crime syndicate depend on information Suzanne can give him, but the girl's very life depends on Mason's finding her before she's located by the man Mason knows only as Gus. We'll hear what Gus is doing in a few moments. First, as Mason drives Mrs. Barkley to Della Street's apartment building. Why don't you look inside the lobby, Della? Hmm? I'll stay with Mrs. Barkley. Okay, Jean. Listen, if the coast is clear, we'll take Mrs. Barkley right up to your apartment. Uh-huh. Uh-oh. Harry. Harry, come here. What is it, Della? Look through the door. The young man sitting on the other side of the lobby. Do you recognize him? No. He's the district attorney's new assistant. His name is, um, oh, a Bonadies. He winked at me. He what? He winked at me when you tried the Taylor case, remember? He didn't wink at me. Why is he here at this time of night? Oh, maybe he's waiting to get a good wink at me. Come on. I'll go in and see them. He is waiting. Well, go see. Okay. Miss Street? Oh, uh, why, it's Mr. Bonadies. Well, fancy meeting you here. Uh, you're looking very well indeed, Miss Street. Thank you. And how are you, Mr. Bonadies? And how's the district attorney? Oh, Mr. Rapt is always in good health. He... Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Rapt has a cold. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, good night, Mr. Barnaby. Uh, just a moment, Miss Street. I've been waiting to see you. I've waited for several hours. 
Why, Mr. Barnaby? Uh, please don't misunderstand me. It isn't a personal matter. Official business? Well, uh, semi-official. Mr. Rapp wants to contact Mr. Mason, your employer. Yes, I know the Mason you mean. You know where Mr. Rapp can reach him? Uh, Mr. Rapp must feel it's very important. If Mr. Rapp feels it's important, it is important. Uh, where can he reach Mr. Mason? Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Barnaby. Before you tell me you don't know, Miss Street, I'll tell you just how important it is. The district attorney has a duty to um, keep his eye on developments. Also, Mr. Donald Wallace, the insurance executive, is a personal friend of the district attorney's. I'm speaking of Mr. Wallace, whose sister is uh, Mrs. Barkley. You know the Wallace I mean, Miss Street? Mm-hmm. Uh, Mr. Rapp succeeded in worming certain information out... Well, that is, Mr. Wallace told Mr. Rapp certain things. Uh, for example, Mr. Rapp knows that Perry Mason staged a phony accident tonight. Mr. Rapp knows that Mrs. Barkley isn't dead at all. Why don't you go ahead and tell me what the district attorney wants? Well, as I say, the district attorney has certain duties and... skip the and... double talk, Mr. Barnabas. Well, uh, Mr. Rapp is concerned and even a little hurt because Mr. Mason didn't consult him. Oh. Mason could have used Mr. Rapp's experience and brilliant intelligence. In other words, Mr. Rapp wants to be dealt in. Well, not officially, you understand. Mr. Rapp can't take part officially unless Mason's scheme works. I understand, but Rapp's ready to jump on the bandwagon in case it does work. Well, I I, I wouldn't put it just that way. Well, I'll give Mr. Mason your message. Oh, good, good. Uh, Mr. Rapp is waiting for Mason's call. Now? Of course. Uh, Miss Street, are you going to say that Mason didn't leave a phone number with his secretary? Mm Mm-hmm. No phone number. Uh, Mr. Rapp is going to be awfully disappointed. Well, I'm terribly sorry. He's going to be disappointed with me, too. Well, I wish I could help Mr. Barnaby's. Any chance you'll see him tonight? Why, Mr. Barnaby's, it's almost midnight. Yes, I know. I've been watching the clock for several hours. Well, uh, good night, Miss Street. Good night, Mr. Barnaby's. Well, he uh, was waiting for you. I'll tell you what, is he gone? Yes, he left in a cab. What did he want? I'll tell you when we get Mrs. Barkley inside. Meanwhile, in another part of the city, a district of narrow side streets and cluttered alleys, Gus Jansen enters a shabby rooming house. Goes up one flight of stairs. Mr. Jansen. Hey, when are you going to move out of this dump, Albert? I've always lived here, Mr. Jansen. It's nothing but a rat trap. You make enough dough to live in a better place? Nix, Mr. Jansen. I got company. Hello. Uh, uh, this is Miss Mildred Duval. Uh. I didn't get your friend's name, Albert. I've been uh, fixing Mildred's radio. Radio? Yes, sir. Mildred just moved in the house. That's right. And I didn't know anybody to fix my radio until Albert said he could fix it. Albert's real smart. Uh Uh-uh, Mildred. I'm only smart about fixing things. I think you're nice to fix my radio, especially at this time of night. I guess you think it's funny I asked him to fix my radio at this time of night. But I work till 11. I'm an usher at the Lyric Movie Theater. Okay, now usher it out of here. Huh? I said beat it, get lost. Well, of all the... Are you going to let him talk to me like that? Take it easy, Mr. Jensen. She'll go out. Is that all you're going to do? He's here on business, Mildred. I'm awful sorry. Well, give me my radio and I'll leave you gentlemen alone. No, Mildred, please let me fix it. After the way you let him talk to me... Oh, please, Mildred, I like to fix things. I'll fix it good as new and you can have it in the morning. Please, Mildred. Well, I don't know. Thanks, Mildred. Thanks an awful lot. You see how good I fix it. Good night, Mildred. Good night, Albert. Good night, mister. You want to sit down, Mr. Jansen? Uh, Not in this dump. Then excuse me, I'm going to sit down at the table. I'm going to fix Mildred's radio. Listen, put that down and pay attention to me. Uh, I'll listen. I can listen better when my hands are busy. I'm going to fix her radio because I promise her. 
Hey, you don't have to talk rough to Mildred, Mr. Jansen. I like Mildred. Forgive my interference in your love life. Oh, she ain't in love with me, Mr. Jansen. But we are friends. I ain't got many friends. Uh, what is it? The police have been checking me. You know why, Mr. Jansen? I have an idea. Never mind that. Here's what you have to understand. I think Gordy's behind it. Gordy Webber, Mr. Jansen? Yeah. So I need Junior. Well, Junior's up in Smithville. Yeah, where he's waiting for Suzanne Barkley to show. So you go up there and take over in Junior's place. Tonight, Mr. Jansen? I, I promised to fix Mildred's radio. Forget the radio. Go up and take over for Junior and send him back here. It'll only take me a minute to fix Mildred's radio. Uh, you, you see, Mr. Jansen? Almost got it fixed. Please, Mr. Jensen, I want to make friends with Mildred. Look, I've told you for the last time, Albert. And here's another. Do what I said. Authorities have disclosed the death of Mrs. Susan Barkley, prominent club woman and philanthropist, under mysterious circumstances. At the same time, it was revealed that Mrs. Barkley's daughter, Suzanne, has been missing for I several said, never months. never mind the radio. Mr. Jensen. Now, quit crying about that radio. Mr. Jensen, didn't you hear him? What? The announcer says Mrs. Barkley's dead. He says... You heard that? Yes, sir. Susan Barkley's mother. Well, get it back, Albert. Turn it in. I can't. You broke it up in a little piece. Oh, no, then go out and get the papers. You told me to go to Smith, but... Now I'm telling you to get the papers. Hurry, Albert. Get all the early editions you can find. Of course, Perry Mason knows. Gus will learn of Mrs. Barkley's supposed death. Mason has taken every precaution to make certain Gus isn't made suspicious. But... I can promise a startling development in the immediate future. So by... It's almost one in the morning. Shortly after the close of our last episode, as August Jensen examines the early editions of city newspapers, reads every word about the death of Suzanne Barclay's mother. But even as he reads of Mrs. Barclay's death, in Della Street's apartment. You sleep in here, Mrs. Barkley. I hope you'll be comfortable. I'm sure I will. Stella? Uh, we'll be right in, Chief. Well, I think you'll find everything you need, Mrs. Barkley. If there's something we forgot, you'll just ask Della. Now, you stop worrying about me. I'll be all right, Mr. Mason. And, Mr. Mason, I, I can't thank you enough. Well, we've only taken the first step, Mrs. Barkley. Now you have reached the hard part. Well, uh... Well, what must I do now, Mr. Mason? Nothing. Nothing but wait and see if your daughter will come out of hiding. That waiting won't be easy. You'll be here alone all day. You'll have to be careful no one hears you moving around or sees you through the window. You can't answer the door if someone knocks or answer the phone if it rings. As I say, there's nothing for you to do. And I know that is not easy. Stella, you have any idea who that is? No. Go in the bedroom, Mrs. Barkley. Don't make a sound unless I call you. Well, shall I... It's your apartment. You've got to see who it is. Oh, good evening, Miss Street. Or should I say good morning? Why, Mr. Wallace. Hello, Mason. Well, you two look surprised to see me. What are you doing here, Mr. Wallace? I want to see my sister. I brought her personal effects. Uh, where is my sister, Mr. Mason? Della, will you call her, please? You shouldn't have come here, Wallace. Why? Why not? No. I want to see my sister. I was most careful no one saw me. You don't think anyone saw you. Donald. Oh, hello, Susan. Mr. Mason is scolding me because I brought your overnight bag. It wasn't necessary, Donald. Miss Street has looked after me. Well, I um, wanted to see you anyway. And I want to see you. And since you're here... Well, can it wait, Mason? I haven't said hello to my sister. Mr. Wallace, you were supposed to be a man whose sister was just killed in an accident. Oh, now, Mason... Mr. Norman, you say you were careful coming here. All right, I'm willing to accept your statement. But let me remind you, a grief-stricken man doesn't leave his residence unless it's necessary. Mason, you can't expect me to stay home and twiddle my thumbs. You can't bear to sit still? All right, move around. But make it plain and clear that you're in mourning. Uh. And whatever you do, don't come here again. What? Don't come here again. Oh, that's ridiculous, Mason. My sister will be alone until after her supposed funeral. I'll be all right, Donald. Mr. Mason, explain You let me handle this, Susan. It's been a long time since I've taken orders from any man. 
And Mason, let me remind you, my insurance company is responsible for retaining you to investigate the syndicate. Mr. Wallace, you remember the terms of our agreement? Mm. I have absolute authority in regard to this investigation. All right. But where my sister and my niece are involved... Which is a part of the investigation. No, I won't argue with you, Wallace. I order you to stay away from this apartment. Oh, you do, eh? Yes. And you will follow instructions or I'll wash my hands of this whole thing. Mr. Mason... Take it or leave it. Hmm. I'm a little impatient with you, Mr. Wallace. You know that there are brains behind this syndicate. Yes, but I... They've killed and they'll kill again. The man called Gus had the slightest idea that we were making a play to bring Suzanne out of hiding. He'll be waiting for her to show, and when she does, he'll take her life. That's why little things are important, Mr. Wallace. That's why I've plugged every loophole possible. Believe me, there are plenty we can't plug up. Oh, I don't know, Mr. Mason. It looks perfectly safe to me. You think so? Yep. Is that why you told your friend, the district attorney, what we're doing? No. Huh? Well, um, why shouldn't I tell him? I've known Fred App for years. He's a fine public servant. Yes, I've known him quite a while myself. Well, I, uh, I told him in strictest confidence. And yet I, I know you told him. Oh. Telling App and his staff is no way to keep a secret. You shouldn't have done it, Donald. Now wait, Susan. You don't understand. I know all I need to know. Suzanne is in danger. She'll be killed. Donald, Suzanne will be killed if that man suspects the truth. Yes, I know, Susan. I, I love her, too. And I see your point. I shouldn't have told for that. I shouldn't have come here. I said I haven't taken orders for a long time. Too long. All right, Mason. I'll take them now. Tell me what to do. Well, Gus has made one discovery. He knows the police have been checking him. But now, as Albert Dallow watches, Gus looks up from the newspaper, shrugs. No, it's nothing, Albert. What, Mr. Jansen? The way you sent me out to get the newspapers, I thought... Don't. Hmm? Don't try to think. You're a genius when it comes to motors and machinery, but... You don't have to tell me I'm dumb, Mr. Jensen. I, I know it. You don't just know it, you glory in it. Yes, sir. If you say so. Miss Barkley being dead don't mean nothing? Uh, just that she's dead. I was startled when I first heard the report. You care if I look at the newspaper story? Can you read, Albert? <laughs> See, Mr. Jensen, I ain't that dumb. All right, go ahead if you like. No, you won't find it in the record of the news leader. It's only in the Daily Blade. Hmm. How come it's only in one paper? Because the man who witnessed the accident phoned the Daily Blade. Oh, yeah. It says so here in the paper. And it says, um, Mrs. Barkley had 75... Uh, 75 G's with her. It's perfectly simple, Albert. Some bright boy learned Suzanne's missing. He contacted Mrs. Barkley with an offer to sell information about Suzanne. Mrs. Barkley was taking him the dough, and she was killed. Perfectly simple and straightforward. Mm-hmm. I don't have any real worries as long as the cops don't find Suzanne, and they won't. I know when she's coming back to Smithville. All I have to do is be waiting for her. All right, Albert? Huh? Go up to Smithville and relieve Junior. I have some unfinished business with Gordy Weber, and I want Junior to give me a hand. Didn't you hear me, Albert? Oh, uh, I've almost finished reading the story, Mr. Jensen. Never mind the story. Now start moving. What's the matter? Um, Mr. Jensen, I told you one time before, you and Mr. J.T. Doherty, you men are real smart. I, I, I never saw a man as smart as you and Mr. J.T. Doherty. Say it, Albert. Whatever it is, say it. I, I, I'm trying to. Um, this is the truth, Mr. Jensen. I always know it when somebody lies to me. I can always tell when somebody's lying to me. I can... Well, I, I can feel... Albert, what are you trying to say? The, the story, Mr. Jensen, the newspaper story. It, it, it don't feel right. What's wrong with it? It's a front-page story. There's even pictures of the car. Mrs. Barkley's dead, and that's that. 
Mrs. Barkley ain't dead. Don't ask me how I know. Don't ask me why they want to print a, a, a big lie on, on the front page of a newspaper. I, I'm too dumb to figure it out, but I know when somebody lies to me. And this here is a lying story, Mr. Jensen. Mrs. Barkley ain't dead. But that, that don't make no sense, does it, Mr. Jensen? Maybe, maybe it makes a lot of sense. I never thought of it. I never would have thought of it if you hadn't... Never thought of what, Mr. Jansen? It could be a plant. The whole thing could be a plant. Sure. I said... But why? Because somebody with brains in his head knows Suzanne loves her old lady. And that smart boy figured she might come to her mother's last services. I'll find out. How can you? It's a plant the Daily Blade's in on it. No other seat in town carried the story. Okay. If it's a plant, somebody on the Blade knows the answer. Who? And, and, and what? The editor. The editor has to know. You can't just walk up and ask him. No, Albert. I'll ask him. And he'll tell me. He'll tell me anything I want to know. Uh, you, you can't manhandle a newspaper editor. Oh, can't I? You'll see, Albert. Because you're going to help me. You stand by for instructions. We're going to ask an editor some questions. Well, what Perry Mason feared would happen has happened. Gus Jansen suspects the truth. And what do you think will happen now? Well, by all means, join us tomorrow. I... Nine in the morning. And by now, the facts concerning Mrs. Barclay's supposedly fatal accident are public knowledge. But, as you know, August Jansen suspects the true facts. And in just a few moments, we'll learn what Gus is doing to confirm his suspicions. First, in the private office of Attorney Perry Mason. Yes, Gertie? The district attorney? Well, all right, tell him to come in. Ah, good morning, Miss Street. Well, you're looking very well. Why, thank you, Mr. Apt. <laughs> yes. Gesundheit. You have a cold, Mr. Apt? Oh, it's nothing serious, you understand. It won't keep me from the performance of my duty. Now, Miss Street, I'm willing to go more than halfway to meet the fellow. I'm even willing to go out in the raw, damp air and come here to see Mr. Mason. Did you uh, give him my message? Why, I haven't seen Mr. Mason this morning, Mr. Abt. You don't mind if I wait here, do you? It mightn't look well for the di district attorney to be seen uh, cooling his heels in an attorney's waiting room. As one of the two or three most important public officials in the city, I'd... Well, I'd prefer not to cool my heels in the waiting room. All right? Oh, it's perfectly all right with me, but Mr. Mason won't be in. Now, just a moment. If you're going to tell me Mason's in court... I checked the docket. His case is postponed. He'll be here. Mr. Abbott. And if you're going to tell me the Barclay affair is none of my business, I feel it is my business. It's my duty. Mason's got his neck stuck out a mile. You think so, Mr. Abbott? I don't know where he's hiding, Mrs. Barclay, but I do know she's alive and well. I should have been consulted from the very beginning. Mr. Mason usually acts on his own initiative. I'm very much aware of that. And someday he'll go too far. I warned him. Yes, I know. Oh, Mason's been lucky so far. And if he does pull this off, it'll be quite a feather in his cap. Oh, think of the publicity. Mr. Mason doesn't care about publicity. He would if he were in public office. But publicity can be dangerous. If this goes wrong... In other words, he's a champ if it works and a chump if it doesn't. Exactly. I really don't take my position too seriously, but the district attorney does have influence. Mason needs all the friends he can get. And I'm reasonable. I'll, I'll do what I can for him. Within reason, of course. Uh, you see, I, I even came to his office this morning. Yes, sir, but Mr. Mason won't be in for some time. Then suppose you tell me where to reach him. He's in conference with the mayor and the lieutenant governor. What? Mr. Mason is on the governor's crime commission. Would you like me to ring the mayor's office? Oh, my, no, talk? no, no, certainly not, certainly not, Miss Street. I... Oh, we mustn't disturb the mayor and the, uh, 
the lieutenant governor, eh? Is in died. Thank you. No, no, Miss Street. We'll uh, we'll just let it go for now. I'll be we? very glad to phone them. Oh, oh I, I I wouldn't think of it. My, no, I. But I I would appreciate your asking Mister Mason to to phone me. Eh? Mm. When it's convenient, of course. Of yes. course. Yes, you you ask him to. Eh? At, at his very own convenience. Oh, yes. <laughs> Good morning, Miss Street. Meanwhile, many blocks away, Gus Jensen stops at an intersection. Hello, Mr. Jensen. Hey, you got on white coveralls. How come, Mr. Jensen? Leave the lettering over the pocket. Hey, Jack's repair service. Now, what's that? You and me? Now open that package on the seat. It's a pair of coveralls for you. I hope they're big enough, Mr. Jansen. Biggest I could buy. You got the pickup truck? Uh, that's it ahead of us. Well, get into those coveralls while I give you the rundown. I uh, told you to meet me here because Arch Colonel lives around the block. Uh, who's he? Editor of the Daily Blade. Oh, that's the newspaper that carried the story about Mrs. Barkley being killed in an accident, huh? Yeah, and if it's a plant and Mrs. Barkley isn't dead, Mr. Colonel will know it because he's the editor. So we're going to ask Mr. Kerner. Dressed up like this? Yes, yeah, so we won't have any trouble getting inside his place. And in case somebody sees us, they'll remember the uniform, but not what we look like. You're awful smart, Mr. Jensen. Okay, get in the truck. You drive. Bring a set of tools? Yeah, sure, Mr. Jensen. How do you know Mr. Kerner's home? I checked last night. He doesn't go to the paper till afternoon. Uh, turn in the service entrance. Colonel lives on the ground floor. Okay, stop here. All right, let's go. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Jensen. What do we say? Oh, never mind. Grab the tools. But, but, but we've got to have something to tell him. Albert, let me do the talking. Now remember that. Let me do all the talking. You're just my helper, see? Oh. oh okay, Mr. Jansen. This is the back door to his place. I can see a girl in a maid's uniform. She's in a kitchen. I guess Mr. Kerner has got all kinds of servants. Mr. Kerner's a very important guy. Now, what's the matter with that dame? Can't she hear... Oh, she heard you that time. Yeah. Good morning, Ajax Repair Service. What? Ajax Repair Service. You were told to come to 3716 Burr Street. My boss didn't say anything to me about it. Oh, yeah? Does he usually say something to you? Yeah. Okay, we'll wait in the kitchen while you tell him we're here. Mr. Kerner's not home. He woke up with a toothache and he's at the dentist. I told Mr. Kerner he had trouble with that tooth, but you he would... expect him back? Yeah. All right, we'll come in and wait. No, you won't, mister. Now, uh, look, baby, we came all the way over here on a service call. Why make two... No offense, mister, but the boss gave me strict orders not to let anybody in unless he said so. You don't say. Now, what's he going to say about you turning us away? I'm just doing what he says, and it's too bad if you don't like it, mister. I'm the housekeeper in charge. Housekeeper? Aren't you a little young and uh, pretty to be a housekeeper? Mr. Kerner likes my work. Uh-huh. He likes my husband's work, too. My husband's the houseman and the handyman. My husband's almost as big as your sidekick here. You want me to call my husband? That isn't necessary. Now, look, miss. I got work to do, mister. Maybe you're the repairman, like you say, but I don't know. Excuse me, miss. Next, Albert. Excuse me, but I just figured why you didn't hear it the first time we knocked. Albert, I told you. It's the electric floor waxer, huh? What? You've been using the electric floor waxer. You turned it off before you come to the door. So what if I did? Turn it on again, huh, please, ma'am? Turn it on again. We'll, we'll wait right here. Okay. Can I see? No wonder you didn't hear us. Yes, yeah, it does make a lot of noise. Yes, ma'am. It's going to burn out a baron if it ain't lubricated. Uh, turn it off a second. Uh, you, you care if I... Uh, Put a little oil on a baron. No kidding, ma'am. It's going to burn out if I don't. 
You can leave the back door open if you don't if you don't trust us. Well, okay, go ahead. But I'm telling you, my husband's right upstairs. Yes, ma'am. It only takes a little oil to smooth it out. I told Mr. Kerner we needed a new floor waxer. Oh, no, ma'am. I, I, I don't think so. Okay. Let's try it now. Yeah, okay, ma'am? Yeah. Yeah, I guess you boys are repairmen. Oh, oh, now I remember. Mr. Kerner said his electric typewriter isn't working right. You boys fix typewriters? We fix anything, ma'am. Uh, where is the typewriter? In Mr. Kerner's study. I suppose you show us where it is. We'll get to work. We'll probably have the job done by the time Mr. Kerner gets back. At any rate, we'll certainly do the job this morning. Oh, sure. You can keep working after he comes back. Oh, we'll work even harder then. Uh, show us to the study, will you? Well, now Gus Jansen is inside the editor's apartment. Now Gus is waiting for him. What do you think is going to happen? You can be certain there are important and surprising developments in the immediate future. So by all means, join us tomorrow, won't you? It's a few minutes past nine in the morning, immediately after the close of our last episode. As August Jansen and Albert Dallow, dressed in white coveralls and posing as repairmen... Enter the residence of newspaper editor Arch Kerner. More of Gus in a few moments. First... Officer Perry Mason? Oh, yes, Mr. Bonadies. Yes, I'll be certain to give Mr. Mason the district attorney's message. You really didn't have to remind me. <laughs> well, how flattering, Mr. Bonadies. You have a nice voice, too. No, I'm sorry. I have an engagement tomorrow night. Yes, you do that. Hmm. Oh, Officer Perry Mason. Mrs. Barkley, are you still in my apartment? Mrs. Barkley, all the local papers and the wire services are carrying the story of your death. It'll wreck everything if you... Please, Mrs. Barkley. Yes, all right, I'll tell him, but hang up the phone right now. Oh, honestly. Oh, hi, Chief. Well, hello, Della. Well, we called off the meeting. It seemed to... What's the matter? You look as if you'd seen the ghost. I've just been talking to one. Mrs. Barkley just called from my apartment. And Mr. App was here. And Jake Jacobson phone. Oh, and Mr. Barkley. Wait a minute, Della. Is Mrs. Barkley all right? Yes, but she wasn't... All right, let's take them one at a time now. The DA was here? Mr. App is uncomfortable. Hmm. He's sitting on the fence. If the fake accident makes Suzanne Barkley come out of hiding, and if her information is what you need to break the syndicate... It is. And if you do break the syndicate... There'll be lots and lots of favorable publicity, and Mr. App wants to share the glory. Yeah. But if things go wrong, there'll be lots of bad publicity, and Mr. App wants no part of that. Mm. His assistant just phoned to remind me that Mr. App would like to talk to you. All right, all right. What did Jacobson want? To talk to you. Jake did a good job publicizing the accident, Chief. I think he'd like you to pat him on the back. Uh -huh. Now, what does Mrs. Barkley want? To talk to you. Did she say Why? I didn't give her time. She promised not to use the phone, so it must be important. All right, we'll go see her. After you speak to Mr. Apt, hmm? I'm not going to waste time with him, Della. Chief, he's the district attorney. All right, so he's the district attorney. I'll speak to him later. And Jake? Later. I want to speak to Mrs. Barkley, now. Meanwhile, many blocks away... Mr. Kerner's housekeeper leads the repairmen to Mr. Kerner's study. Now, listen, you boys be sure your feet are clean. I just waxed this hallway, you know. Uh, your feet clean, Albert? Uh-huh. I don't know why Mr. Kerner didn't say anything about calling the repairman. Say his typewriter's on the fridge? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's here in his study. Uh, you expect him back soon, you say? Oh, yeah. He won't stay at the dentist any longer than he has to. Mr. Kerner hates to go to the dentist. Well, go on in, boys. There's his electric typewriter. Oh, miss, um, will your boss come in the front door? or? What? Uh, well, I mean, will you tell him we're here when he returns? Or, oh, well, I don't know. He always lets himself in, and he always spends his mornings in here before he goes to the newspaper, so he'll probably just come straight to the study. Why? Oh, I, uh, I just want to know where to send the bill for our services. Oh, oh, well, uh, you can ask him. Yeah, I'll do that. 
There's a laundry man. I guess you don't need me. Oh, we'll get along, thanks. Okay. I uh, say, if you boys smoke, be sure to use the ashtray, huh? Yeah, sure thing. Look at here, Mr. Jansen. You can see the front door out this window. We can watch for him. And when he comes... Look at this, Albert. Soundproof, huh, Mr. Jansen? Yes, Albert, soundproof. Uh, take the cover off that typewriter and scatter a few tools around in case the housekeeper comes nosing in. Yes, sir. And then, when Mr. Kerner gets here, we'll go to work. What about afterwards, Mr. Jansen? What do you mean? Well, after we get through talking to Mr. Kerner, we'll have to shut him up or he'll tell the cops. Uh-huh. And, and when the cops find him, won't they smell a rat, Mr. Jansen? I, I mean... If they did stage a phony accident to make uh, Susan Barkley come in... You've been thinking again, haven't you? Well, I can think a little, Mr. Jansen. So can I. When we finish uh, talking to Mr. Kerner, you'll notify his office he's going out of town. You will also notify his housekeeper he's going out of town. And he'll go if we ask him. Because when we finish talking to Mr. Kerner, he'll do anything we ask him. You know what I mean, Albert? Uh-huh. I, I, I don't much like what we're going to do. Uh, but you, you do like it, don't you, Mr. Jansen? <laughs> what are you doing, Albert? I found a wall safe. You care if I open it, Mr. Jansen? Well, don't use a jimmy on it. Everything's got to look right when we leave. Oh, I ain't going to force it. It ain't much of a combination. <laughs> yeah. I can feel the tumblers. <laughs> You're a funny guy, Albert. Uh, what'd you say, Mr. Jensen? You talk like a dummy and you act like a dummy. But you're a genius when it comes to machinery. Thanks a lot, Mr. Jensen. Yeah, there it is. Uh, let's see. There's nothing in here but a little book. Oh, look at this, Mr. Jansen. It's full of poetry. What? Ain't this poetry? Uh, moonlight through my window. Here's another one. Where is my love of my tender youth? <laughs> so the tough newspaper editor writes poetry, huh? Oh, there is something else in here. That's a reel of plastic tape. What is it, Albert? I think it's a recording tape, Mr. Jensen. Why did he lock it in his safe? Uh, there's a tape recorder over here. Want me to play it? You know how to make it playback? Oh, you know I do, Mr. Jensen. Well, go ahead, start it. Well, you, you have to give it time to warm up first, like, like, like a radio. Yeah, it's funny he made a recording and then stuck it in his safe. I wonder why... Quit wondering and turn it on. Okay, okay. It's warmed up now. Confidential memorandum to Mr. Porterfield. Porterfield is Colonel's boss. Listen. Wednesday, April 14th. You did this yesterday. Dear Mr. Porterfield, I'm going to send this tape directly to you and not to your secretary because, as you will see, this is a highly confidential matter dealing as it does with the Barkley affair. Mr. James, shut up. As you know, Jake Jacobson has worked in... Cooperation with Mr. Perry Mason. I don't need to remind you how circulation jumped when Perry Mason gave Jacobson our scoop on the Cesar case. <clears throat> if you'll remember, sir, you were uh, unhappy when you learned I was cooperating with Mason at that time. As a matter of fact, you called me on the carpet and gave me a good dressing down. <laughs> well, not that you weren't justified in calling me on the carpet. <clears throat> now, at any rate, in view of Mason's past accomplishments... I felt justified in cooperating again when he asked us. Now, Mason has been secretly investigating a huge auto theft syndicate. He staged a fake accident in which Mrs. Susan Barkley is supposed to have been killed. Now, Mrs. Barkley's daughter, Suzanne Barkley, knows the identity of a key figure in the syndicate. But Suzanne is in hiding. Now, Mason is counting on Suzanne reading of her mother's supposed death. Mason feels that she'll come to her mother's last services. Suzanne will most likely come disguised, but Mason will be waiting on the alert. I'm sending you this memo in explanation of 
certain expenditures called to your attention by the auditing department. With warmest regards, I remain Arch Kerner. Okay, Albert, put that back in the safe. Let's get out of here. Oh, well, go on. Well, tell the housekeeper there's nothing wrong with the typewriter. Move, Albert. But well, don't you wonder to find out I if... found out. I found out everything I need to know. Mason will be waiting for Suzanne, will he? Okay, baby, I'll be waiting, too. 